I have Peter Ballersted with us. Peter is a forage agronomist, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he is creating a bridge between two worlds that actually belong together, and it's hard to imagine that we've gotten ourselves so far apart that we need a bridge. But he's actually doing as wonderful work in the realm that he works in and is trained in as he is over here with us, and it is a privilege to introduce him, and it is a privilege to know him. And whatever you might have heard, meat eating depends on livestock, and so therefore does the human being. Please welcome Peter. Howdy, everybody. Howdy. Come on. Howdy. Ruminants rule. Okay, so... Uh, welcome to Carnivore. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having this. Amber, put your hands together. Thank you for all the volunteers. So I have one primary purpose here today, and I want to exercise any demons that are possessing you that are giving you a sense of guilt about eating animal products or eating more animal products or eating lots or exclusively animal products. We are faced with some narratives and stories that come at us. And so please understand that these are the same people that sold you the diet that made you sick in the first place. Right? Hello? Okay. And if you're not aware of the background story, then please talk to us. We can tell you some of the common people. I mean, exactly the same people. Then and now, the dietary guidelines weren't delivered to us by, you know, the mothership. They, they weren't just de novo. They were the product of the time and social movements. And they are still with us today, okay? We have been enjoying the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought, I'm afraid. For far, far, far too long. Okay? Now... A lot of these arguments sound really, really good. They sound like they've got a, you know, a good, coherent story, but I just want to start teasing these things apart. I want to start unfraying the rope and testing each strand, because when we test each strand, we find that they fail. And this is objective evidence that we can bring to the conversation. It's hard to have these conversations. You know, you can't give the person the, the fire hose to start with, so you give them a glass of water and let them check it out. So hopefully today I can give you some information. Um, the, here's one of my beliefs. Um, the preponderance of evidence from all scientific disciplines strongly suggests that the most likely harm associated with meat consumption is from not consuming enough. Yeah, that's a tough line to deliver to an audience like this. <laughs> T-ball. Um, but, hey, uh, we are faced with arguments to say we're eating too much meat. So, okay, we have a health story that we should bring into this conversation. Um, <clears throat> you know, the state of our nation metabolically is dismal. Over half of adult Americans have diabetes or prediabetes. 60% of adult Americans have one or more chronic illnesses. 88% of adult Americans do not enjoy optimal metabolic health. This is the unsustainable crisis we face. And I assure you that this has not yet been onboarded into the conversation about sustainability. I think it needs to be. Because frankly, the only truly sustainable form of agriculture, or the most sustainable form of agriculture we've got is ruminant animal agriculture. And I'll go through a number of reasons why I believe this. But I want to extend the conversation about sustainability from grazing to grave, from pasture to plot, as in funeral. 
the winning formula is ruminant animal agriculture plus metabolic health equals sustainable societies. And this is a case that can be made. We may need to learn how to do it. We may need to find new ways to deliver that message, and I'm certainly looking for input, suggestions, guidance, direction. <clears throat> so for people who don't know what a ruminant is, other than the ribs that we just enjoyed, um, uh, ruminants are these gifts of nature that are specially designed to utilize this resource that we can't utilize directly for food. They have multi-compartmented stomachs, four. They have cloven hooves. They re-chew cud, the process of rumination. These are the animals that are a key link in the energy and nutrient flows throughout the environmental systems of the globe. They are absolutely essential. There is no replacement. If we just, and, and, and they're not just all cows. All of these are tasty. <laughs> they're all different forms of processed plant or fermented plant products. But different ruminants have evolved to take advantage of different feed resources. So some ruminants are more browsers eating the little tender leaves that are higher in nutrients. And then you have on the other side ruminants like cows that are designed to use the grass and roughage sources. And there's different anatomical, different ingestive uh, features of these. Um, so just to give you a sense, uh, I showed, oops, I showed a footprint at the beginning, and that was from the oryx. Um, different spelling, but hey, I lifted the figure, so I can't complain. Um, thank you. Plagiarism bad, leveraging good. Um, so there's just this hard ecological reality that we have to face. As human beings, we belong to the heterotrophs. We've got to eat something else. We've got to eat another organism. We can't take carbon from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, and make complex carbohydrates out of that or fats out of that. We can't take nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and assimilate that and make protein out of that. Something's got to die if we're going to live, just the way it is, okay? But different forms of food are not equal, and neither are their production systems. So let's just go down th through a few of these. Energy, I mean, we understand that energy from plants, even equal calories, doesn't have the same metabolic effect as an equal amount of calories of fat from animals, right? Thank you. Group participation is expected. <laughs> Protein and minerals. If we have the same quantity of either of those from plant sources and animal sources, they don't produce the same metabolic effect in a human being, right? Okay. We just heard how vitamin requirement is, in fact, highly dependent on the food source. Yes? Yeah. Excellent. So plant sourced foods are not required. Now some people might like them. I've given up plant matter for Lent, but I know I'm denying myself. Um, such a saint. But the sad reality for humanity today is humanity's diet is plant based. The majority of humanity's calories are coming from plants. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? The majority of protein in humanity's diet today is coming from plants. Now in the so-called developed world, yes, we get more from animal sources. Some of us might suggest that's not enough. But is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does it have metabolic consequences? Do we even know how much protein the human being should be fed? Uh, I 
So this is the air we breathe. The vast majority of our atmosphere is N2 gas. We can't use that directly. And then followed by oxygen, which is a byproduct of photosynthesis, then we have water vapor. By the time we've taken care of this, we're at like 99% of the atmosphere, just to give you a sense, okay? Then we'll talk about some other um, gases that are important, so nitrogen, oxygen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, we'll hit methane. All right, let's keep going. Um, I know I've got too many slides and I apologize in advance. Life on Earth is based on cycling carbon dioxide, right? We have to get, we're reducing carbon dioxide to carbohydrates and then we're going to oxidize those back. And likewise, we're doing a similar process with nitrogen gas. In fact, oxygen in our atmosphere came as a result of the development of photosynthesis producing oxygen as a byproduct, which was toxic to certain life forms at the time. And that carbohydrate forms sugars, sugars like glucose. We hook glucose together one way, we make starch. We hook them together a different way, same molecule, we make cellulose. Cellulose is a planar mo molecule. No vertebrate animal makes cellulase, the enzyme necessary to cleave the bonds between glucose units. So the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere can only be utilized if we've got microbes somewhere in the process, breaking that down to liberate that energy and make it available. If we didn't have that, then we would face decreasing levels of CO2 very rapidly. Now, this is one of the interesting things. I can take any substance and put it in a bomb calorimeter and get some estimate of energy content. Yes? That's gross energy. This number should look familiar. How many calories per gram of carbohydrate do we confidently talk about? 4,000. Well, kilocalories. Nice try. <laughs> Ruminati points are awarded. <laughs> Human nutrition is based on gross calories. Gross energy. Yeah, ooh, well done. Points awarded. Um, but even though we have very similar caloric content of alfalfa hay versus wheat straw, we have very different metabolizable energy, okay? We do that in animal nutrition. We'll wait for you to catch up. <laughs> Nitrogen cycling, again, mentioned the majority of the Earth's atmosphere is N2 gas, can't get that. We have to have some form of fixation to change N2 into a form that's utilizable by plants. And then we need animals to utilize the plants to then put that into motion and then that, those compounds can either be lost from the system, either as gas or leaching or runoff. Lightning does this. Human beings do this with a lot of fossil fuel. Uh, Haber-Bosch process. Uh, we have a host of microorganisms that also fix nitrogen. So all of our clovers, alfalfa, beans, peas, those legumes form these symbiotic relationships and fix nitrogen, which then gets utilized to making protein. And here's some more detail on the sources of protein for humanity. And I'd like you to note that 38% of humanity's protein is coming from animal sources. More of humanity's protein is coming from cereals than from animal sources. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Bad. I don't know. It, 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 it suggests that there could be problems. Um, because what else are we getting with cereals? Well, we've heard about it already, right? Ruminants are providing if we, you know, milk is 10%. 
We've got cattle and buffalo at 4%, sheep and goat at 1%. So that's 15% of humanity's protein supply is coming from ruminant animals. So if somebody's going to say we're going to get rid of it, what are we going to replace that with? Okay. And then we also need to spend just a bit of time to introduce the concept of crude protein, which again is the value that human nutritionists use. <laughs> crude. Crude protein is calculated by determining the total nitrogen percent in a feedstuff, multiplying that number by 6.25, because we assume that all the nitrogen that was in there was in protein, and all that protein was 16% nitrogen. Hey, presto. Okay? That works okay for ruminants, for, because of a reason I'll tell you very shortly, but it's not so good with monogastrics. Not so good. And in fact, if we dig a little deeper, we start looking at specific amino acids. And then, in fact, if we start calling that true protein and comparing it to the crude protein, we see that only 58% of the crude protein was actually true protein in the beans. So if anybody starts talking to you about substituting vegetable protein sources for animal protein sources, know that you need to increase that value tremendously. Okay? Thank you. And in fact, now we can get into some social justice issues, because the reality is that for the poorest 20% of the tropical population around the world, rice provides more protein per person than beans, meat, or rice, or milk. And rice sucks as a protein source. That's a technical term. <laughs> you can use that. If you're not familiar with this DIAAS score, I encourage you to go look up the FAO report that was released, oh, I don't know, 16 years ago? Saying that we ought to replace, we should no longer talk in terms of protein and grams, we should no longer talk in terms of crude protein, we ought to be talking about specific amino acid content. Um, but I digest. So, so cattle and other ruminants contribute directly to global food security. Despite what people would have you believe, Cattle rely on grazing and forage is the vast majority of all the feed that goes into supporting all of ruminants, including those in the United States, is in fact inedible by humans. On the order of 90% of the lifetime feed that goes into producing the typical grain finished steer in the United States, over 90% of that feed is not human utilizable. And in fact, the protein that we do feed gets upcycled, it gets improved. We take a resource, we make it far more valuable for our use. You're welcome. So if we look at both quantity and quality, the value of the proteins and the animal products for human consumption, in this case, milk and beef, get it, a cheeseburger? Okay, um, notice no bun. Is, it took me a long time to find that picture. Is <laughs> two point one five times higher than that of the proteins in the potentially human edible plant protein inputs. So even that bit that could be eaten by humans is made more valuable. Okay, this is, this is really important stuff. This gets to sustainability. We're making more out of a resource that is usable and we're converting an unusable resource into something of high value. So Earth's surface, somebody starts talking to you about how much of agricultural land is used to produce livestock, right? You've heard that? And if we just stop producing livestock, look at all the more you know, healthy soybeans that we could produce. <laughs> well, if you hear that, understand that what they've done is they've unintentionally, or intentionally, conflated agricultural land with cropland or arable land. Cropland or arable land means the same thing, land suitable for cultivation. Not all cropland, not all agricultural land is cropland. 
Okay, so watch that game. And if, in fact, we look at the details, something like only 4% of the Earth's entire surface is suitable for cultivation. By the way, when cities expand, being so close to Denver, I can ask this question, B, what, what kind of land do they expand into? Yeah, the, the, the good farmland. So that number's going down worldwide for a number of reasons, not just development, but also degradation due to a number of things that we could talk about. But if you look at the same time, 14% of the Earth's surface is some kind of long-term grassland. Call it rangeland. Call it land that should never be tilled. And then 10% is forest. We can design systems where grass and trees grow on the same piece of ground. We can run animals through that. We can produce high-quality animal pro protein and animal fat on those agroforestry systems. So now we've got a quarter of the Earth's surface, roughly, that is suitable for producing a very valuable product. So the next time you hear, and virtually all of the world's arable land is already in production. Now, we can take some of the marginal land and convert it, but that comes at a cost. And you better calculate that into your discussion about environmental impact. And in fact, now if we just choke it down and just look at the land surface, 63% of the land surface is non-agricultural. Only a relatively small amount of that remaining agricultural land is in fact ideally suited to those crops that are listed. Okay, so these, this is what we have to work with to produce the food that we need to feed humanity, just in case it comes up. And already, in case you hear something about how we're feeding all this grain to livestock, and if we stop, we could just feed that to humans and it would all be great and the unicorns would smile. And, um, well, the vast majority of what's already being produced is already going to humans. Only a, less than a quarter is going to animal agriculture. Another way to look at it, if you just look at barley, corn, rice, sorghum, soybean, soy meal, soy oil, and wheat, almost two-thirds is going to human consumption. It's food. Food humans feed animals. Okay? So just in case it comes up. And we can drill down a little further because it differs depending on the crop you're looking at. So yes, the majority of corn goes to feed. Good use for it. Rice, all of it goes to humans. Right, so a little different, obvious. A little wheat goes to animals, but mostly it's going to human consumption. Um, I've been known to say that the problem is not the grain-fed cattle, the problem is the grain-fed people. <laughs> if you look at all the food feed, sorry, caught myself. If you look at all the feed that goes into feeding all of the livestock in the world, on an annual basis, it's estimated to be 6 billion tons of dry matter. But something over 80% is 86% of that is not utilizable by humans. Sounds like a good deal to me. Ruminants are essential in human nutrition. Let's start with the, the land, let's start with the ruminants, humans in the bottom left. Three things we can do with land to produce food. We're, we're not going to talk about aquaculture or harvesting wild stocks from the ocean, something like that. That's for another day and somebody else. Um, we can grow forage crops, something that we harvest and haul off for later feeding. We can graze animals directly on pasture, rangeland. Yes, we can gra grow grain, oilseed, fruit, and vegetable crops. But when we do that for human consumption, we also produce a fair amount of byproduct stuff. We can feed that to ruminants. So even while we're producing human utilizable crops, 
Livestock agriculture is integrated into it. Without the livestock agriculture, then we've got waste product disposal, then we've got increased cost, then we've got reduced productivity. Okay? So we feed some of that to humans. Um, we could also feed it to the ruminants. Ruminants can take non-protein nitrogen and make protein out of it. That's a great trick. <clears throat> Where are the sources of essential nutrients? Oh, yeah, that would be mil meat, milk, and byproducts. Okay. There's waste products. You know, those go to humans. There's waste products from both. Uh, we're not really good at this, sorry, at this last bit of getting the nutrients from humans back to the land. That's pretty well broken. I don't know what that would look like to fix it. Um, but in terms of the ruminants, far less of what they eat ends up leaving the farm system. They recycle the vast majority of the nutrients that they consume back to the soil to maintain soil fertility to improve soil health. And we're dealing with perennial plants. Perennial plants want to make extensive root systems. That's how they live year to year. They're putting more organic matter into the soils. This is a good thing. As compared to the annual crops that only need to make a seed crop so that they can perpetuate that way. So again, there's differences between the crops that we would grow if you want to call grassland a crop. This is the unsustainable crisis as well. 24 billion metric tons of topsoil lost due to erosion per year worldwide. You can see the comparison. That's taking six inches of soil from the state of Kentucky every year. Or Iceland. <laughs> and once that's gone, it's gone. And cultivation necessarily degrades soil health. And cultivation of some form is a necessary part of producing commodity crops. Factor that into the conversation. If somebody ever tells you about how, first of all, if anybody starts talking to you about cattle farts. <laughs> and as I've said before, I enjoy a good fart joke as much as the next guy. But in this case, it's not farts, it's belches. So can we at least get the right end? But if they start talking to you about how cattle or livestock produce more emissions than all of transportation, just please remember the following, that all of agriculture in the United States produces roughly 9% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions that all of animal agriculture produces four. Somebody help me with the math. What does that leave? That would be for plant agriculture, wouldn't it? Okay, good. Um, and that the beef industry represents 2%. Transportation is 28%. So just you know, data that's available. Um, I have a, one citation that says the healthcare industry <laughs> produces 10. That's a little unfair, but I love using it. I haven't weaned myself off of it. It's not exactly the same kind of life cycle analysis that we're talking about here, but in any case, it does point to the fact that there's an environmental cost to the healthcare industry, right? And in fact, if all of animal agriculture were eliminated in the U.S., We'd reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. by 2.6% and 0.36% globally. <laughs> oh, but at a cost. We'd unbalance our food ecosystem and cre create es essential dietary nutrient deficiencies. Right? Cost, benefit. Cost, benefit. In fact... <laughs> We need to start talking about essential nutrient yield, not total mass yield. When we do that, we find that animal source proteins actually come out to be roughly equivalent in environmental effect from an emissions point of view as the plant sources. Okay? Is that a little different? I do want to point out that this, in fact, is a greenhouse gas. It's water vapor. 
So if we actually want to co- calculate what would be your footprint, your greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 equivalents, if you ate the equivalent of two pounds of raw beef, boneless trimmed, per day for a year. Okay, got it? Good, okay. It's less than the tailpipe emissions for driving 17,000 miles in a car getting 25 miles per gallon or flying 33,000 miles commercially in 1,000 mile two flight trips, right? So understand? Tailpipe, this is just the fuel you burn. This is everything it takes to produce the beef, and it's less than that. Make sure that people are comparing apples with apples when they start citing numbers. They frequently aren't. And by the way, I think that's a great deal, but I may be biased. Somebody starts talking to you about water. Nationwide, oh, that's the other thing. Make sure that they're talking to you about U.S. values versus global values. Okay, that makes, make sure we understand what we're talking about. If we look at water use per pound of raw, lean, trimmed beef, nationwide average is somewhere around 440 gallons per pound. So in case you hear you know, thousands of gallons per pound, okay? There's some contradictory information available. And in fact, if you account for runoff, it drops it down below 400. And if you're in the northeastern U.S. where you don't have to irrigate, it drops a little bit. (laughs) So make sure that when somebody's talking, you know the region you're talking about. Because it varies, and we've got beef cattle in every single state in the nation. If you want local food, eat beef. So, there are 27,154 gallons per acre inch. An acre is 209 feet by 209 feet. Boulder, Colorado, average precipitation, 20.7 inches per year. That's the equivalent of 3.5 pounds of raw beef per acre per day. Just to put it in context. A standard parking space is 9 feet by 18 feet. So that's somewhere between a quarter pound and a four pounds of raw beef per parking space per year. So the next time somebody talks about Meatless Monday, start talking about parkingless whatever. <laughs> and isn't it interesting, they never come up with Tofuless Tuesday. I'd be for that. Soyless Sunday, Soyless Sunday points awarded. There's a whole lot of buzz about carbon sequestration in the soil. It is important, but I think we've kind of missed the plot. Um, We should be looking more at the water cycle, um, or at least considering the water cycle. So having grass long-term on the soil makes the soil healthier, better infiltration, better water quality, better watersheds. This is just a real quick demonstration. We drop a clot of soil into this water column. We've dropped one in here first. The same soil types, this was conventional corn for a number of years, this is long-term grassland. 25 minutes later, the clod has dissolved, there's no water-stable structure as compared to under the grassland. Um, Beef has value beyond what they get paid. And it has a social benefit, and we're only beginning to consider that. And when you go through the calculations, you come up with a net of somewhere around 30, 49 cents, no, sorry, 37 cents per pound of beef as a social benefit. Remember, this is about cost-benefit analysis. That's accounting for the carbon cost. And that has not included the cost of metabolic illness yet. Think that'll go up or down? So, quick review. Um, Humans are heterotrophs, we have to eat something. Animal products are superior sources for nutrition in the human diet. 
Ruminant animal agriculture offers unique ecological advantages over other forms of food production. There can be no sustainable agriculture without ruminants. Ruminants increase the quality and quantity of humanity's food supply. Animal protein is superior. Fats from animal products, especially from ruminants, are beneficial while the lipids from plants have actually been shown to produce harm. Minerals are more bioavailable from animal source foods, providing essential nutrients unavailable from plant source foods. Modern humans exist because of ruminants. Modern societies depend on ruminants, and they will be essential to the future of humanity. Estimates of ruminant animal agriculture's environmental impact are typically overstated, oversimplified, and misleading. This, I, I think everybody here is familiar with Mr. Randolini. Um, yeah, so I'm recruiting people into the Ruminati. I want to help people learn this information, so I share sources. So we can all become better educated, and again, at least individually, let's stop listening to those voices that would tell us that this path that we're on that's producing benefit is going to harm the environment. So, recruiting for the ruminant revolution. <laughs> and part of this is to make you value your health appropriately. Okay? that when you improve your health, you are improving the world. And then social justice again, out of the 770 million people living in extreme poverty, half of them are pastoralists or smallholders. So if we start impacting agriculture, animal agriculture, what do we do to them? So, um, I've gone too long. I knew that was going to happen. But there's a lot to cover. There's a number of topics that I haven't touched. Be here. Be in Denver. I'm available. Please feel free to contact me. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Peter.